Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ruland Gardner. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here in Park City today, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I had the opportunity to receive a, a first of all, a text message from Paul Sanderson, who was two years younger than me in high school, and I actually played football with his brother, and just seeing Paul outside, he said that uh, he was the reason why I got on stage. So if you guys know who Paul Sanderson is, how many of you would like to see us wrestle on stage? <laughs> You got to be willing to take one for the team, right? So, but that's, you know, just a small glimmer. And just to think, you know, and I'd like to kind of share with you some of the amazing opportunities I've had in my life. And just think about the experiences we have. Think of a few opportunities or obstacles of times that you got to pursue and overachieve. And for me, this was an opportunity. This was even a realistic dream, even that year, was to go into the Olympics. And it was a thought, it was a hope, it was a goal, it was something maybe could happen someday, but it wasn't really a reality. And I wanna share with you some of the experiences that got me to winning the gold medal and has helped me to kind of mature and help me realize my potential in my life. And I wanna share with you seven steps that help me overcome any obstacle, anything that's put in front of you as a challenge, how do we overcome, how do we pursue and reach our success and reach our glory that we wanna accomplish? And I wanna share with you some of the amazing experiences of a young boy, and I was born and raised the youngest of nine children. And there's a term we used on the farm where the cow manure runs downhill. Being the youngest child, I got a lot of crap work. But instead of complaining and saying this isn't fair and this isn't right, so many kids nowadays, you know, make excuses. Oh, I can't do it or this or this. It wasn't an option in my family to make an excuse. I had a responsibility to help the family succeed. And being raised on the farm, responsibility and work was never ending. And these seven steps helped me to realize that potential. As I grew up on the dairy farm, I learned how to work. But then also as I continued and started my education, they realized I had a learning disability. And that was an opportunity to prove myself. And the first of the seven steps for me in my life to overcome obstacles was to go back to the basics. Each and every day as a young child, work and responsibility was given to me. As I started my schooling, they said, oh, you're slower than the other students. You're not quite as developed. You have a learning disability. Your reading comprehension isn't as good as the other students. And I could see that. But instead of holding me back, my parents said, hey, let's do everything we can because he has good social skills. Let's help him to advance with his classmates. And so they put me in those classes, but then they also pulled me out and they put me in special ed. And special ed is where they take you in and you have many different age levels and many different students doing many different subjects. And they put me in there and I fell a little bit further behind every day. And with my learning disability and the reading comprehension, I struggled and I had battles with my confidence and what I could do. And as I got a little bit better and as I started to learn about myself, I remember having an experience. And it was a day that was kind of something that I chose to do. It was a day where an obstacle was put in front of me. I had a kid and I was in sixth grade and I remember he was teasing me and I thought, you know what, I'm going to beat you up. And I got up and I come around and I was getting ready to hit the kid. Probably would have gotten a lot of trouble, got the belt from dad. But I was going to hit this kid and I said, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Why are you going to hit him? He is just, yeah, he's making fun of you, but you're struggling. You're not as good as your classmates. So instead of lashing out and being violent, you need to turn that energy in yourself and say, I can do better. I can become smarter. I, be I can become proficient like the other students. And so it drove me to want to be better when people made fun of me, when they challenged me, when they gave me something that I couldn't achieve. And so I learned that day to work through that negative emotion. As I got older, I had a brother, and his name was Reynolds, and he was the eighth of the nine children, and he used to beat me every day in the sport of wrestling. Until my senior year, I lost to him every day. And he used to tease me and make fun of me. You'll never beat me, you'll be second best in the family. And it made me so mad. But what I realized, I wasn't wrestling just to wrestle and win. I was wrestling because it got me off the stinking farm because I hated working on that stinking farm. 
So every day I found opportunities. But when I got in sports, I said to myself, you know what? Why not go out there and do the best you can? You don't have very much expectation, but why not? And so I went and I learned and I worked and I got better at many different sports and I had fun by learning. And I had in high school a teacher, his name was Bill Hoops, and he said to me something. He said, Rulin, and he was one of my special ed teachers my sophomore year. He said, if you come to school every day and you do your absolute best, your best, not theirs, but yours, and you do your absolute best, I promise you, you'll be successful. And I thought, wow, here's a special ed teacher that believes in me. And I thought, what is success for me is a, basically a sophomore in high school. And I thought success for me wasn't the Olympics. It wasn't even high school graduation. Success was to master the one thing in front of me. And so I started focusing on what was in front of me and I did the best I could with what I had and I got a little bit better. And as I got better at the end of my junior year, I got to play football, varsity football my junior year. And in the my, end of my junior year, I beat my brother for the first time in the sport of wrestling. And I beat him a second and a third time. And coach came in and said, Rulon, it's your brother's senior year. You have one more year. Do you care if he goes and wrestles for the state championship? I said, no. My brother won the state title. My senior year, I won the state title. As I got done winning the state title, I got done and I got ready to graduate. And I went and I talked to the advisor and I wanted to go to college. And I wanted to become a teacher just like all those teachers gave me the knowledge and the strength to do something, I wanted to give that knowledge to the next generation. And so I decided I wanted to be a teacher. As I talked to the advisor in high school, the advisor said, Rulin, you do not have what it takes to go to college. If you go to college, you'll flunk, you'll fail, you'll, you'll be you know, passed out, you won't be able to graduate, and you'll become a quitter. So why go to a hard school when you can go to a technical school where it's easy? But I said, no, 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 I want to be a teacher. And they said, we don't think you have it. And I went home, I said, mom, this is what the advisor told me. And my mom was furious. She said, do not listen to what they tell you because they do not know the heart that you have within you. And I went in and I talked to the advisor and I said, okay. And I chose to go to Rick's college. And the coach there was a guy named Bob Christensen. And Bob, my senior year, watched me wrestle in a tournament, my hometown tournament in Afton. And he watched me lose but he still recruited me. And when I got to college, I said, Bob, I said, why did you recruit me? He said, Ruin, he said, even though I watched you lose, and I was, 30, or I was 23 and one my senior year, I had 23 pins and one loss. The one loss is because I got cocky, I got arrogant. I had pinned that kid the year before. Even though he played college football and he was 6'6", I still could beat him, and so I was a little bit cocky. And he said, you know what, I watched you wrestle, and you thought you could beat him with two seconds left and you were losing by five. He said, that's something I can't teach you. You have heart. He said, I can teach you all the ability in the world to become a champion, but I can't take a person with no heart and make him a champion. That will not work, and that's what you have. And my college coach believed in me, and I spent two years, and I won the junior college national championship, and I really started to get better at wrestling, because all the way through my youth, I didn't work on the, I didn't go out there and wrestle during the summer. I worked on the farm. My morning started at 6.30 every morning all the way until usually 10, 11 o'clock every night during the summers. So my years were spent working on the farm. During the school year, we were up at 6.30 every morning getting the cows in, getting the cows milked so I could go to school. After school, came home, milked the cows, fed the cows, did the chores, and then I tried to do my homework. But a lot of times, my homework is the one thing that never was accomplished. And as I got done and I graduated from Rick's College, I went to Nebraska and I got there and I said, I want to be a teacher. I went to the physical education department and they said, Rulin, we here at Nebraska believe if you get in physical education, you'll flunk out within one year. You do not have what it takes to be a teacher at Nebraska. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, give me a chance. And they said, we don't think so. And I said, please, please. And I begged for a chance. And they said, we don't think you'll make it, but here, here's your opportunity. And as I went home, the head wrestling coach, Tim Newman, said, Ruin, they don't think you have what it takes to be a student and to be a teacher here at Nebraska. I'm like, why is that? Because the physical education program in Nebraska was the fourth hardest degree at the university. Anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, biomechanics, exercise testing, all those classes had to be learned. Plus, I was an athlete, but the one thing was, in high school, because they never thought I'd go to college, they never made me take any high school algebra. So in high school, I had to make up two years of high school algebra when I was in Nebraska. 
So I not only had practice every day at a Division I wrestling school, I also had my other classes, plus I had to make up two years of high school algebra, but I had an opportunity. And as I left the counselors that day, I made a promise to myself, and I went out and I made a choice that I would not miss one opportunity to graduate. And I never missed in high school one class because I didn't want to go. In college, I never missed one class because I didn't want to go. Because every day I pursued and I wanted to be the best at being a student and being a teacher that I could possibly become. And I went through and I really started to see my wrestling develop. But as I got closer to my senior year in college, I was ranked number two in the country. I saw a huge improvement by going and wrestling at Nebraska. By developing, I got almost to the point, and I'm going into nationals, ranked number two in the country, and I felt a little bit of the pressure, and I got to nationals, and I made a mistake. I ended up placing fourth place my senior year at the NCAA wrestling tournament, and I fell short of my goal. I got done wrestling, I came back, and I had some of my friends said, Rulin, you know, get into, you know, get into just, you know, being a teacher. Don't worry about wrestling. I had some people say, no, 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 get into wrestling. Quit school and become an Olympian. I even had some of my friends said, hey, dude, quit school and come home. It's easy. But as I thought about it, I'm like, what is my goal? And my goal is to be a teacher. And so I continued my education for two and a half more years. One year later, when I was actually going to school still, after my senior year of college, I had a chance to meet Garth Brooks. And I'm like, wow, Garth, I'm like, that'd be so cool. You know, he wrestled, or actually he threw javelin at Oklahoma State. And he knew all the wrestlers, and so I could, could meet Garth. Or I could study for my anatomy bone exam. And I'm like, oh, 207 bones, meet Garth Brooks. And I decided to study. I got 192 points out of 200 points on my test. And with me, learning wasn't easy. So I had to focus every day. And as I made that choice that day, I developed, I think, character. And as I went, I finally graduated after six and a half years of college. Because what I, do, what I wasn't told was when I transferred from the junior college to Nebraska, out of 64 credits, only 16 of them were transferred. As a junior, I started as a freshman. That's why I tell kids, and I get to go all over, the, all over the country every year, I tell them, become educated, learn, know the rules of the game. If you are not prepared for the battle, you will not over, overcome your opponents. So prepare yourself every day. As I graduated from Nebraska, I was so focused and so motivated that I wanted to become a wrestler. I wanted to continue because I saw myself go from a mediocre high school wrestler to a pretty good college wrestler. But now college was over. Now what? The next goal was the Olympics. And I remember seeing Corell, and the first time I saw him in a video, I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a big 180 pound guy. And they said, no, 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 he's heavyweight. And I'm like, no, he can't be heavyweight doing what he did. He's 6'5", 300 pounds. He's a colonel in the Russian army. He's the head tax collector in Russia. He's in the parliament and he's one of the head guys in the mafia. So, <laughs> Just a little distinction. And as you saw in the video, you know, old Russia back in the day, before 2000, remember we were giving them billions of dollars to stay afloat? There's more billionaires in Moscow than New York City. Karelin's one of the five richest men in Russia. That's how quick things change in this economy, in this world we're in nowadays. But as I saw Karelin, I go, wow, you know, he has the strength of an Olympic power lifter. He would do back handsprings before the match start. So he would go out there and just scare people because he was such a phenom. But as I started training, I didn't think of that as a fearful thing. I thought it was as, it, as an opportunity for me to go out there and learn. And as I went to start training, I actually got out to Colorado Springs and I started to realize there was a great American named Matt Kafari, an Olympic and world silver medalist. As I got there, Matt Kafari said, Rulin, you can't beat me. Rulin, I'm better than you. And it was just like my brother told me. So instead of thinking of him as being too great to win, for me, I thought of it as another opportunity to overcome. And as I went back to the basics every day, I built character. Just think about something in your life that you can go back to and you made the right choice. But then also go back and think about something you made the wrong choice. What character could have you used, utilized as a young child? Because as we were children, as little babies, we thought we could do anything. But as we start going through life, people start telling us. We start doubting, we start questioning, so we limit our potential. What can each and every one of us do in our lives if we allow ourselves to dream? For me, 
I didn't have any limitations. People said, how good can you become? I said, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean you know? I'm like, I haven't been there yet. I'm not going to say I can only become this good. People are like, oh, don't you want to just get to the Olympics? I said, yeah, that's part of the goal. But I said, I have bigger goals. So for me, it wasn't just going to becoming a good wrestler. It was becoming the best wrestler that I could. So as I got to Colorado, I started to train. McAfee went and he won the Olympic silver medal in 1996. As I got there, I started to realize, you know, all that character that I developed as a young child and all the way through college made me better, made me stronger. And step two to overcoming obstacles is to turn a negative into a positive. In our lives, when people question us, they doubt us, how do we handle the negative thought process? For me, as a person says, you can't, you won't, you will not, instead of going, you're right, I can't. I said, no, no, no. I can and I will and I'm going to. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but through hard work and adversity, I know I can be successful by developing that. I turned that negative fuel into a positive fire that drove me to succeed. Step three is to go out there and enlist other people. Look around you today. There's the leaders of your company, the people that make you good. There's people who support you. There's people here and there's people at home, the people that make you who you are. For me, I enlisted all my family, all my coaches, all the coaches and all the people that could help me be successful. But not just the people who liked me. I enlisted Corellan. And the only way I can enlist him is to study by looking at videotapes and matches and experiences, I went out there and studied what the people did that were better than me. I didn't ever wrestle Greco-Roman as a young child. I worked on the farm. So what I had developed was hard work. And as we sat down, we did what was called APR, Athlete Performance Reviews. As I sat down, I had very few expectations when I first moved to Colorado. But Steve Frazier, our national coach, said, Rulin, you have the ability. He was a 1984 Olympic champion. He said, you're really rough. You don't really know about it, but you have the perfect body, the perfect mindset. And we call these things positive affirmations. These are the things that make us the best that we are at what we do. The positive affirmations that I had were very small. The things that made me good was my hard work, my tenacity, my desire, my devotion, my perseverance. When most people got tired, I didn't. And they could see that from the beginning. And they said, this will take you to the Olympic Games, I promise you. And that was for my national team coach. And I said, wow, how does he see? Because for me, what I saw is I'm only 6'1". Most of my wrestling opponents were 6'4 to 6'6". Most of the guys have been wrestling Greco-Roman their whole life. I hadn't. Technically, physically, they were better than me. Technically, on the mat, I couldn't even compete. Physically, lifting weights, I didn't have a shot. Because my lifting weights as a young child was lifting hay bales, was lifting 40-pound hay pipe, you know, sprinkler pipe, irrigation pipe. Those are the things that I did. That's what I was good at. But when I started to train, I saw potential. My coaches saw potential. And they said, Rulin, if you go out and you do everything you can, I promise you, you'll make the Olympic team. And this is for my coach. And I said, wow, what would it be like to make the Olympics? And for me, my goal wasn't winning a medal. My goal was to walk in the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games wearing that warm up. That was my dream. And I set that goal. So as I started to pursue that in 1996 to 1997, I improved and I got better. I ultimately made the world team in 97. I went to the world championships and I got to wrestle Corell in one time before the Olympics. And in 97, he beat me five to nothing. He threw me on my head three times. As he threw me, I landed, my face hit the floor, my feet kicked myself in the back of the head twice. In that match, I broke two vertebrae on my neck. And when I walked off the mat, most people would be like, I got robbed, it was, you know, whatever, you know, pretty mad and not honest. But as I walked off the mat, I said, hey, I'm getting better. I only lost five to nothing. Because for me, I think we have to be honest with reality. You know what? I didn't get robbed. It wasn't a bad call. The guy's just better than me. So as I walked off, I said, you know what? I do see myself getting better. So I learned from that experience. And I came back from 1997 to 98. I trained and I worked hard. But I lost to Mac Gaffari, who in 1998 came back in and made the world team and won a silver medal at the world championships. Again, I went from number five in the world to number three in America. And I came back in and Steve Fraser, we did our APR. He talked about all the things we did and I enlisted every person around me. And step four 
is to go out and train hard every day. And Steve Frazier instilled hard work and commitment. We used to do things that most people thought were crazy. We used to do one thing that was called a grind match. A grind match was a workout. It was a practice. It was a one hour to two hour wrestling match. No water break, no time to you know, get something to drink. You wrestled for two hours straight. And it was so amazing to see the transformation. For me, I didn't know if I could do it. I questioned myself, yeah, of course I did. But as we started the two hour grind match, as we start at 30 minutes, you're thinking, you know what, I'm pretty tired. I don't know if I can do this. At 45 minutes, you're going, oh, I'm not even halfway done. But an hour, you're going, hey, this isn't that bad after all. And what was so fun, is we'd bring these guys in from Russia and Europe, and it was so fun, you'd bring them over, and your goal, my goal, was within 30 minutes, I wanted to make him cry. Because physically, they wrestle for six minutes. That's it. They never trained for two hours. So it was amazing to see them mentally break down and question their ability. And for me, what made me good is I started here most people got tired. As I started here, I got stronger. At the end of the match, I was stronger than I was at the beginning. And so for me, I saw myself develop and I saw myself learning. So after an hour of the grind match, I'm thinking, hey, I'm halfway done. In an hour and 30 minutes, I'm going, hey, I'm almost there. In an hour and 45, an hour and 50, you're not even tired. At two hours, you're going, this wasn't even hard at all because you break through those barriers. Because when I started wrestling, all these people were better than me. I was number three in, the, in America. I was all these people behind. But what I did is every day we hit the wall. What do you do when you hit the wall? Mentally, physically, do you back off and go, whoo, good try today? Or do you push the wall further? For me, I pushed that wall and it was amazing. Most people backed off and I pushed through it. At the end of a grind match, my partners were so tired, they would go over and sit down. I'd get up and do sprints. Most people are like, you're crazy. I'm like, I'm not crazy. I'm committed. What's the difference between those two things? For me, I wanted it more than they did. The day after grind match, we'd come back and we'd do something that was pretty fun. It was so amazing going into the 2000 Olympic trials that we'd have six or seven heavyweights. The day after grind match, they would be so beat up and tired and so kind of you know, self whiny that they would stay home. Nobody would come in and wrestle. So the day after, I would grab four or five 200 pound wrestlers and I would go what's called a shark bait. One guy goes in the middle of the mat for nine to 20 minutes and every minute somebody attacks you. And what was so fun for me is after that one minute when he left, he would be more tired than I would, and I'm the one that stayed in the middle. So what I slowly started to do was master my emotion and realize that I was better physically and I was better conditioning-wise than they were. So if I could control that, I knew I had a shot. And so I started to improve in 1996 or 1997 to 98, I trained and I lost and McAfee took second in the world and I came back and it was amazing. I've been to over 40 countries all over the world. I've been to Russia and Cuba. I've been to Cuba eight times and I've been there and I've won all these tournaments and I got good and I started seeing myself get better. And from 1998 to 1999, I went and I trained and I won every tournament, but I lost at the U.S. Nationals and I ended up number three in America again. And I said, wow. I said, I'm number three. Dramil Byers, my training partner, he went and he ended up taking six at the Worlds. And I came down, back in and I sat down with Steve Frazier. I said, okay, Steve, I've been here for three years. I've taken fifth at the Worlds once. I'm number three in America. I said, I need to drastically change something. He said, Rula, no, 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 no. Don't change a thing. I'm like, well, but I'm number three. He said, no, no. He said, Rula, I promise you and I guarantee you, if you train for the next year, as hard as you have for the past three years, you'll make, and you'll make the Olympic team and you'll win a medal. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I'm number three in America. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've been number one once. I'm so far away. And he said, no. He said, trust me. I know how good you are. I know what you have in you. And I promise you, if you do that for the next year, you'll make the team and you'll win a medal. And I walked out of his office going, wow, how can he believe in me that much? How can your bosses believe in you that much? Why? Because they got the best. They got you. And for me, I thought, you know what? He believes in me. I believe in me. 
And I went for the next year. I won every tournament, and I got to the Olympic trials, and I'm sitting there waiting to wrestle. It's one-to-one. I won a match. He won a match. We're getting ready for the final Olympic trial match. And I look up, and Matt Gaffari is sitting there with the coach, and I don't know if he has no UFC, but Randy Couture, before he started fighting. And they start laughing. And they start having a great time. And I'm sitting there questioning myself, doubting myself. And I see them just having a great time. I thought, you know what? He's not even serious about this. He's not committed. I'm not, fo- I'm not losing focus. I am so dedicated to making this Olympic team. I went out there and I crushed him. And I pushed him around. I beat him one to nothing to make the Olympic team. And that was Matt Kafari's last match. I beat him, the reigning Olympic silver medalist. I beat him to make the Olympic team. After I beat him, all the media ran up they interviewed Matt Kafari. My sisters ran up, and I have four sisters, and they're not very nice. And my sisters are like, aren't you, they said, pissed off. I'm like, no. They're like, why not? I said, because I'm going to the Olympics. I'm like, but the media and this and that. I said, who cares about the media? I'm not here to be on TV. I'm here to go to the Olympics, and I'm going, baby. That's what mattered. And I said, now what? I said, I'm getting ready for the Olympics. And we went back, we started training. I'm living in Colorado Springs. I get ready and I focus. And one month before the Olympic Games, we go to a tournament in Russia. It's called Padubny. In this tournament, you have 30 Russians in every weight class. And a Russian's number one goal is to beat an American. They do not like us. So as we went out there, I get to the finals of the tournament. And instead of Karelin wrestling, he said out of the tournament, I'm wrestling the number two Russian, a guy named Yuri Petrikiev. And Yuri's number two in Russia. Barely lost to Karelin. And I went out there, and Karelin's watching the tournament. And I go out there, and I'm like, I'm going to beat you, and I'm going to get you. And I was so focused, and I was so confident, and I was so arrogant and cocky. I went out there, and I attacked him. And I wanted it. He took my aggression. In 13 seconds, he took me, he threw me, and he pinned me. First time in 13 years I'd been pinned. As I walked off the mat, they raised his hand, and I picked everything I knew about the sport of wrestling, and I put it on a table. As I put it on the table, I picked up the pieces of knowledge that would help me to be successful. I left my arrogance, my cockiness. I picked up my hard work, my determination, the positive affirmations. Most people have all these accolades. I had very few, and I couldn't waste them. So when I got out there, I got a shot. And we got to Sydney. Steve Frazier said, Ruin, you've bled, you've cried, you've done everything you can. You've trained hard every day. And I see the commitment every day. Now step five is to take care of business. This is your opportunity right now. And as I got there, I said, I'm going to do everything I can. I went, I trained in the morning, I went and saw my family. I had 16 family members come to Sydney. All my brothers and sisters, my parents, they were all there to support me. And I was so happy for that. And I realized, you know what? Even if I lost, they would see me achieve something that most people thought I'd never do. And so I gave everything I had. Prepared, practiced, did everything. Got there, I weighed in, had a good draw. Corell and me were on the opposite sides. So I thought, you know what? I have a shot. First match, I won eight to two. Second match, I won six to zero. The third match, I won two to one. The fourth match, I'm losing two to zero to a person who's from Israel, he's about 6'5", and he looked like Mr. Clean. And he was born and raised in Russia. So technically, physically, he's a good wrestler, and he's beaten me two to nothing. And Steve Fraser's like, Rulin, relax, you're gonna beat him, relax. Because most guys, when we go to Europe, they're out drinking and smoking and partying and vodka, having a great time. And my coaches always saw, and he would always tell us, hey, he was out until two o'clock last night, and he was drunk. So burn him, hurt him, make him pay for last night. So coaches saw that. Being a good coach, he saw weakness. And Steve said, Ruin, you're going to outcondition him. Push the pace, make him break mentally. And Steve Frazier kept me confident going through the match. And I had about two minutes left in the six-minute match. And Steve Frazier said, go for it. Here's your opportunity. He's tired enough. And what I did is I physically picked him up. I carried him to the edge of the mat. And I was going to throw him for a three-point throw. I would get the lead. And I was so committed on throwing him that in the sport of Greco-Roman or international wrestling, if you start to throw in the circle, but you finish it out of the circle, even off the mat, they'll give you what's called continuation. Because I was so committed, I carried him from the center of the mat to the edge, and I was so committed, I carried him off the edge of the mat onto the wood floor. As I hit the wood floor, I threw him. Boom. I elevated. I actually did a full arch and a body lock. We call it a souffle, 
where I actually put my head, my head hits the back of the floor, and my partner goes over top of me, and I knew that I was going to throw him. So I threw him to the left, but he knowing which way I was going, he went to the right. So it was my weight, his weight, and my head hit the wood floor. His chin caught the wood floor also. As I popped him through, I thought I would see three points for the throw, and the referee's like, whoa, 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 way far out of bounds, no points, you're too far off the mat, back to the middle. As I got up, I remember walking back, and I hear Steve Fraser go, Roland, look at him, you got him, you did it. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I just got a concussion, and you know, I'm sitting there trying to figure out where I'm at, and he's like, look at him. I'm like, I'm like who? And, and I look over, and he's on the floor, and his chin is just bleeding. And they're taping up his chin. He said, look in his eyes. You broke him. What that means was you, find, you found and you had found the mental barrier. You found that area that broke him. Here's your opportunity. You can beat him now. As I came back to the middle, I'm waiting for him to come back in. And I thought, you know what? Do I believe? And I said, yes. Within 20 seconds of blowing the whistle, I scored a point. Within another 20 seconds, I scored a second point. In overtime, he was so physically tired to start overtime, the referee had to help him to stand up. As we went in, within 20 seconds in overtime, I scored my third point. I won the match three to two. Wasn't pretty, wasn't easy, but I won. As I looked up, Corellan had been watching. Corellan's like, this is easy. But the thing was, we came up with a strategy. How can you beat somebody who's 6'5", they call him the experiment, they call him the bear. He's 2,001 odds favorite to beat me. It's not very easy, but the opportunity was there. And I said, you know what? You may beat me, but I'm going to give you everything I got. And right as we're walking out, the coaches are like, ruling, you can beat him, ruling, 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 ruling. And they're telling me all this stuff. And I said, leave me alone. And the coach is like, what? I'm like, leave me alone, please. Because the month before I lost focus, every day when I went to Colorado Springs and I went to the Olympic Training Center, I went to practice. I didn't have fans and coaches talking to me. When I went to practice, I had me. And every day in my mind, I had me. When I went to practice, there was one person I envisioned wrestling, and it was Corellan. And that was my day. They say, act like you've been there. In my head, the past four years, the one person I imagined wrestling was Corellan. So that day, I had been there many times. And people said, weren't you scared walking in? And in my book, there's a picture of him scowling and me, like, walking in. And, you know, I got in, and I remember standing there and them introducing me. And I remember the thing I th said to myself was, just don't start crying on national TV. Because <laughs> I'm sitting there like, this is the best. You know, I didn't know what to feel. I'd never been in the Olympic Games. But I had been there. And I said, you know what? Just go out there and wrestle. 1996, the Olympics before Sydney, his partner in the final match rolled over and pinned himself because he didn't want to get hurt. That was the fear that people had for him. I knew he was good. I wasn't scared of him. And I think that was a bonus. As we started, our goal wasn't to beat him. Our goal was to get in his face, to challenge him. When he would use strength, we would use quickness. When he would use quickness, I would use power. Use his enemy, use his weakness against him. That was our goal. As we went through the first period, he couldn't score, I couldn't score. And his goal is usually scoring, and then it's basically a cascading effect where it's easy. He would win matches 10, 12, 13, 0 because people would basically quit. And for me, I didn't quit. As we went through the first period, nobody scored. They blew the whistle. Second period, they put us what's called a clinch position. As you could see in the video, they put us in a body lock. As Corellan locked up the body lock, I said to the referee, hey, this isn't fair. But the referee, instead of saying, Russia, be fair, the referee said, attention, USA. If you don't allow him to attack, it'll be a caution of one. And I'm sitting there going, I don't want to lose everything I've done to this point in the Olympics. As I went out there, even though it wasn't a fair lock, the referee said lock. And at that point, I said, even though I may get beat, I'm still going to take a chance. Because if I didn't, he would have been awarded two points because I was fleeing a hold. As I got the lock in the position, Corellan, they blew the whistle. Corellan hesitated. If he would have executed and he would have done what he knows he could do, he would have simply beat me. But he hesitated. He gave me a window of opportunity. As I went out there, I continued to attack, and finally he made a mistake. He broke his hands, but the referee on the mat said, oh, USA, you broke your hands, Russia gets a point. Two of the three referees saw that. The third referee said, I don't know what I saw, 
we should probably review the tape. And so they went to review the tape. As they're sitting down to review the tape, right behind the head referee's table is the Russian Federation. And the Russians were trying to influence the gold medal match. And so the Russians were like, <clears throat> give us a good call. And the referee said, no, we're going to do the right call. We're going to make the right call. And we're going to give the points to who's deserving of them. The referees came back and they gave me a point. The first thing I did after the point was awarded is I wiped the sweat off my brow. What that meant was everything up to that point was great, but I have to put it behind me. How many of us go to work and we have a great early morning, we go to lunch, we come back, and we're like, you know what, I don't know. Put that behind you. It's now a second half of your day. How many of you watched the Denver Broncos last night? Came back from down 24 to nothing, they didn't quit. They're champions, they're warriors, they're fighters. That's what you have to have. You have to think every play is your last play. As they came back, as I came back in that match, even though we were going into the second period, into the third period, I had nine minutes to hold off Corellan. Eight minutes into the match, Corellan stopped and he started slowing down. Less than 30 seconds, kind of Corellan stopped wrestling because he realized he hadn't conditioned himself. Because that day, I had wrestled one other match. That day, he had wrestled two. Even though it wasn't a lot, he hadn't trained himself. He hadn't wrestled two-hour grind matches. As time ran down, I wasn't tired. I wasn't fatigued. I wasn't even exhausted. It was all about staying focused, like the coaches said. If you stay focused, you can beat them. They told me that. Did I believe it? No. But they told me that, and that's what helped me. As I won the match, I got up, I did the cartwheel in the front row, and there's something pretty kind of interesting. I don't know where that came from, because everybody before me did backflips. And I, first of all, I cannot do a backflip, first of all. And so everybody's doing these backflips, and I'm like, wow. And I get done, and they're like, one of the guys like, you need to do a cartwheel? I'm like, sure. And I remember watching, uh, you guys ever watch Dumb and Dumber? In the restaurant, Jim Carrey does a cartwheel in a front roll. I'm not saying that's where I got it from, <laughs> but I did a cartwheel and I did a front roll. And so after I, went, I came back to America and I got to do Leno and Letterman and Oprah and Rosie, and they're like, how did you win? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, what do you mean you don't know? I'm like, I truly don't know. They're like, but you won. I said, the coaches convinced me. They made me believe. Without their support, I wouldn't have. But they didn't give me an option to fail. With that support, I can do anything. They're like, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to go win, a go win another world championship. And I came back in 2001. I made the world team. I got to the world championships in Greece. And I'm wrestling Yuri Petrakiev, the guy who pinned me in 13 seconds. In this match, I go out and I attack him. He scores a point. I try to throw him like I did the Israeli. He scores two more. I'm losing three to nothing with a minute left. And I go back and I attack him. I throw him three straight times out of bounds, under attack, and the referees could have given me points. But him being the Russian, they said no. Came back to the middle with less than 20 seconds. I'm losing three to nothing. And I thought, you know what? You won the Olympics last year. And I said, no, stop it. You will wrestle until the referee stops you. As he blew the whistle, I stepped in, I picked him up, full body arch, I pinned him with less than 10 seconds. I won the quarterfinals by fall. I won the semis three to nothing. I won the world championships 2-0 because I wouldn't quit, I would not give up. Three months after winning the world championship, everybody's like, you gonna retire? I said, no, I'm gonna keep wrestling. I went back to Afton, Star Valley, Wyoming, where I'm from, and I went back there because I was getting ready to come down to Salt Lake for the Olympics, and I was gonna have fun, have a good time. So I was with two of my friends on February 14th, Valentine's Day. And I'm with two of my friends, and we decided to go up on top of the mountains to get up on top of what's called Wagner Mountain. As we get almost to the top of Wagner, I can't get there, my snowmobile won't make it. So I decided to go up over another mountain pass, and I get almost to the top, I get stuck. Come around, and two of my friends, one of them said, hey, my daughter's playing basketball, I need to go. So he left to go watch his daughter, so it was me and another guy, and I said, hey, give me one more shot. We're about 30, 35 miles up in the mountains through the canyons. And I said, give me one more shot, and I get almost to the top, I get stuck. Come back around, I look for my friend, I can't find him. And I realize he's not there. I'm like, huh, I wonder where he's at. And I thought, well, maybe, you know, he's down here. And I make choices. Not always good choices, but they're committed choices. As I got down to this area, I didn't realize where he was at, and I got down the bottom of this gully, and it was about six feet of powder, and I thought, I hope I have enough power for my snowball to turn around and go out back up the canyon. Started going up, and I got stuck. So I realized the only way I could go is to either 
turn and go down the mountain through this gully, wherever it goes, or I could be, you know, get off my sled and walk to the, you know, top of the mountain that would probably take me two hours, or I could wait to be rescued. And I thought, you know what? I'm an Olympic and world champion. I don't need help. And I turned the snowball and I went down through the canyon. I thought I could survive and make it through. As I got down in, I hit two water holes. I got in the water and my, my snowball sunk. I jumped off the sled and I thought, you know what? I can get in the water and get wet or I can wait to be rescued. I'm an Olympic champ, I don't need help. So I get back in the water up to my thighs, up to my shoulders, I pick up the 600 pound snowbill, start it, push it out of the river twice. Get down the bottom of this big, nice little meadow, and I realized I couldn't get back up the hill. So the only choice was to follow the river, Salt River, back to Afton. So I started following it, I'm in and out of the river for about two hours. It's seven o'clock at night, I finally got to a point where I had no other choice but to drop in the river. I drop in the river and I start to go for about 200 yards and my snowmobile gets stuck between two big boulders. I pull my snowmobile, I slip, I fall into the river. Turn over, I stand up, now I'm completely wet, completely soaked. But the problem was that day, it was so warm, I didn't wear my winter jacket. I didn't have my really thick winter gloves. I had a t-shirt, a sweatshirt, and a fleece top on. Everything I had on was wet. And I thought, you know what, now you're in trouble. Now you need to find a place and wait to be rescued. I didn't know how bad of a situation I was in, but I knew I was in trouble. I thought when I first got wet, I had an hour before things started to freeze. And as I found a place to sit down, I found three trees. And I sat down from 7.30 at night until 4.30 in the morning. I stood up and I sat down. At 4.30 in the morning, I got up and I remember having a vision. I remember seeing Jesus and God and my brother Ronald who came to me in this vision. And they said, Rulon, it's time to go home. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not ready to die. I, I don't want to go yet. I want to come back and I want to wrestle. I want to go to the Olympics. I want to have a family. I want to, you know, I'm just starting to get good at life. And, you know, I'm not ready to go yet. And they're like, Rulon, it's time. I'm like, no, 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 please, please, please. And I remember waking up and being like, yay, there's life after death and life is good and being so happy with everything. But then also realizing I still have the two coldest hours ahead of me from 4.30 to 6.30. At 6.30, I got up and I'd been shivering and I would sit down on my legs and my legs would go numb and I'd get up and I'd walk down to the river. And it took me about 20 minutes to make it from here to the back of the room. And I got down to the river and I was so dehydrated and so cold. My hands were already frozen, everything was, so I just got in the river and I took a drink of water. I remember standing up being like, I need to walk, but I need to lay down. And I thought, you know what, just lay down and take a rest. And I sit down and I see the stars, you know, disappearing, thinking I'm dying now, as I hear an airplane come up. He comes in the canyon, the first pass he sees me, I'm like, hey, it's an airplane. And that's exactly what I said in my head, it's an airplane. And as soon as he saw me, he turned around, he flew out. Came up and he called the search and rescue, he said, he's still alive. It was 25 below zero and I had been up there for 15 hours. And as they said, you need to get here. All my clothes, I was white because everything was frozen. It was wet and frozen to me. And he came back in and for three hours, he circled me. Because the Salt Lake Olympics started, there was a no-fly zone. You could not leave Salt Lake airspace. So for three hours, we waited for somebody to come rescue me. Finally, a helicopter at Vidho got sick of waiting. They took off, they flew over, they picked me up. As they picked me up, they got me in the helicopter and I crawled about 50 feet to the helicopter. They get me in, the doctor, the, the pilot's pushing me in, the nurse is pulling me in, and I get in and I'm shivering and shaking and my body's convulsing and, and they get me in. And they, fly, they flew me about three minutes over the mountains down. That's all it was. As they took off, my core temperature was measured at 80 degrees. As they got to the hospital, they got me in a wheelchair, took me inside, and they got me on the, you know, the gurney to try to start taking my clothes off. It was all frozen, so they started cutting everything off. They get to my boots. My boots are frozen to my feet. The doctor said, I don't know what to do. They got a cast saw out, and he split my boots in half, and he took them off my feet. My feet were completely frozen. The doctor said, I can't help you. You need to go somewhere else. At that point, all my friends start showing up, and I start laughing. They're like, what are you laughing at? You're crazy. I said, no. I made it. They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I made it. Because for me, I didn't think about life and death and all that. I was dying. It was over. For me, my goal was to see the sunrise. I don't know if you've ever been at that point in your life where nothing else matters but one thing. I would have given everything I ever owned for one match to start a fire. I didn't care if I started a forest fire, but I wanted to stay warm. 
I would have given everything I had. They flew me there for the hospital in Idaho Falls. The doctor there said, Ruin, your feet will be amputated within a week. You're done. Your feet are dead. And I said, Dr. Thurman, will you do everything you can? He's like, Ruin, I can't promise you. I said, Dr. Thurman, will you do everything you can to keep my feet? He said, Ruin, I'll try. I said, no, no, I need a promise. He said, Ruin, I will promise. He started researching and talking and everything else. Went through, I started losing all the tissue on my 10 toes. The first half, the bottom half of my feet were frozen. Took all the tissue off. They did the first surgery, skin grafts, and they started replacing it. Went in. They did actually the first surgery. They took me in. There was no blood flow. I had no blood flow in my feet. They took me in the hyperbaric chamber, and after the first visit, my feet started to come back. Month of hyperbaric, another few months, another three surgeries. I ended up losing the middle toe on the right foot. In June, I started to wear shoes. In July, I started to wrestle. In August... I went back to Colorado and everybody said, what are you doing? You can't wrestle. You can't, you know, be back at the national level. My feet were still bleeding. It wasn't good. And I said, I'm, I'm just back to, to be part of this. I'm back to get back to health. And they said, I don't know. And I said, please give me a chance. I got back there. I started training. And in September, my training partner won the world. Tramiel Byers went from number two in America to become a world champion. As I went back to Colorado, they said, dude, you can't even walk. What are you thinking? He's a world champion. You'll never beat him. Step six is to aim high when you're feeling low. Another day, another obstacle, another opportunity. I came back within eight months. I beat Jermil Byers to make the 2003 world team. At this point, even today, I can't feel my toes. So if I walk and I look off balance, because my feet won't tell me what they're doing. Because of frostbite, I lost the function. I don't have the range of motion. I'm not as powerful as I used to be. So what I had to do was make up. In 04, I was bigger and stronger. I benched 450. I squatted 550 in 04. Went out there. I made the Olympic team. I had Dramil Byers. He called me up the day after I beat him. He said, dude, I'll help you do anything to make and to win a gold medal this year. We went to the Olympics all the way to the semifinal match. Perfect tournament. I'm in the semifinals, one-to-one, -one, in overtime. I'm attacking my partner, and I got it perfectly where I want him. I'm going after him. He does a knee tap. Gets me off balance, knocks me down. He scores a point, and he beats me. All the media ran up, and it was amazing to see what famous sportscasters were there. As I lost the match, they came up. They're like, you're a loser. You're a failure. I'm like, what do you mean I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not a loser? But like, you lost. I'm like, yeah. They're like, but, but you lost. I said, I'm good at losing. That's not the problem. I said, I've done it many a times in my career. They're like, but aren't you upset? I'm like, sure. But I did everything I could. And there was always three things I asked myself every day. Did I do my absolute best? Did I do everything in my potential? Is there anything else I could do today to help me be successful? I ended up coming out and they said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to win the bronze medal. My bronze medal opponent was 6'9". He was from uh, Iran and I beat him three to nothing. I won the bronze medal. Decided to retire, walk off, leave my shoes on the mat. At that point, I'm like, oh, I'm going to take some time off and start relaxing. But that's when life kicked in. You know, life started kicking in the gut and, you know, the economy and everything else we have nowadays. And so I started relaxing. And I made a decision back in 2006. I had an opportunity come to me and a lady said, hey, here's a real estate deal back in Afton. Here's an opportunity. And I said, you know, what? I'll invest in this. I'll help you build your dream. And I signed on a loan. And for 2006 to today, I don't know if any of you heard the recent media, you know, kind of beating me down and everything else, but I had an opportunity where a lady frauded me in a Ponzi scheme and I'm potentially going to lose everything I own because I trusted her. And it hurts and it's back in my hometown and everything else, but what do I do? I fight. What have I been? I've been a fighter. I got on the biggest loser and I lost 185 pounds. I went to the Olympic trials this year and I was less than four pounds from making weight this year after losing almost 200 pounds from being on the biggest loser. Came back all summer, I beat the tar out of Dramil Byers, the guy who went to the Olympics, and the coach was like, what are you thinking? You're 40 years old and you kick his butt. And one day we had a two hour grind match, or a one hour grind match. I beat him 30 to nothing. And I hadn't wrestled in eight years. And people say today, you know, am I gonna come back? My goal, potentially, in four years, I'll be 44 years old, is to make the 2016 Olympic team. For me, do I have it? Thank you. Do I have it? Yes. Do I want it? Yes. Am I driven? Yes. I've had the best people in the world around me. I've had all the obstacles in the world around me, but I've had opportunities. If you ask people for help, they'll help you. And that's what I've had in my life. I've had nothing but amazing people help me. Step seven is don't rest on your laurels. 
After I won the Olympic Games, I was focused. After I won the Olympic bronze medal, I was focused. But then I lost track. What do we have to do when you lose track? Get back on track. Have people support you. My wife, my family, the people around me, the coaches from USA Wrestling. I'm on daily contact with the national team coach. He said, Rulin, he said, this, even though you're 40 plus years old, there's nobody in the world that can beat you. I know you can do it. And to have that confidence from a coach of mine gives me every belief in the world. To this day, I have my gym up in Logan. I have all the opportunities of the world because of hard work and determination and dedication. If we do it and we believe in ourselves here in America and around the world, we can do anything. The opportunity to be successful is here if we perceive and if we choose to dedicate ourselves. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to speak to you today.